Hey guys and welcome back to another episode of my history series where today we're going to be covering one of my most requested videos ever or at least one of my most requested history videos ever. I get requests for this and the troubles at least once a day and before anyone asks I am going to do the troubles one day I just find it really intimidating to get into so we're going to start with this the Magdalene Laundries. If you're anything like me and living outside of Ireland, this might be a term that you've heard of time and time again without ever really knowing what it means, without knowing exactly what happened and just how bad it was. The term Magdalene laundries doesn't quite capture the pain of what they really were and you'll also hear them referred to as Magdalene asylums. But the laundries were literally, as the name suggests, a place where women did laundry except they did it under the worst possible conditions. At their very core, the laundries were cruel and medieval institutions where so-called fallen women were basically imprisoned and stripped of their human rights, forced to work behind locked doors for no money, abused by the Roman Catholic nuns who were supposed to be helping them. The laundries were supposed to be a place for young women to do penance for their sins, all the time guarded by the nuns at the metaphorical and physical door, but instead it became a place for any woman outside of the Catholic standards of Irish society to be hidden away. And for many years, it worked. Even when the last laundry closed down in September 1996, discussion around what really happened in the laundries remained on the down low. You only really knew what was going on if you were a part of it or knew someone there and it just didn't hit the mainstream news. Obviously, it would have made the government look very, very bad. Real discussion around the Magdalene laundries wouldn't really begin until the early 2000s when the Irish government would finally admit they were abusive institutions. But even then, a lot of what really happened was brushed under the carpet and for years I resisted all calls for an inquiry into them or even an apology. At one point across Ireland, there were 10 to 12 laundries being run, run by four separate religious orders. The Good Shepherd Sisters, the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity, the Sisters of Mercy and the Sisters of Charity, all Catholic obviously. The official figure of the amount of women and girls housed in these laundries between 1922 and 1996 is said to be about 10,000, but it seems that it might have been much more than this. But over the centuries, the number is estimated to be as high as 30,000 or more. The largest of these 10 laundries was High Park Convent in Dublin, which in the early 90s ran into some financial difficulties. As a result, the sisters were forced to sell a tract of land to developers in 1993 for £1.5 million. It was 11.5 acres of land in total. Even the reason that the nuns were forced to sell this land are a little bit dodgy. They said they incurred heavy debt after building a new centre for women in need, but it seems that they might have actually just had a very bad time with the stock market. The land that the sisters sold to the developers just so happened to have a burial ground on it. A mass grave in which they said 133 women had been buried between 1886 and 1986. Only women who had died of natural causes of course, women who had chosen with their own free will to spend their entire lives in the laundry at High Park. But for any development to take place here, the bodies were going to have to be exhumed and be buried elsewhere. And for that to happen, there was a lot of paperwork to be filed and licenses to be granted. Out of the 133 bodies, the sisters were able to provide just 75 death certificates. They were able to give the names of 34 women for whom there was no death certificate or even a cause of death. 23 were only identified by their religious names like Magdalene of whatever and one woman who's only identified by her first name. Their deaths were never declared, which is not only ethically questionable, it's also just outright illegal. It's a criminal offence in Ireland to fail to register a death which occurs on one's premises. But regardless, the exhumation went ahead on the 23rd of August 1993, and from what I can gather, the developers and the sisters actually split the cost of exhuming these bodies. 
Only when the exhumations began, it became clear that there were much more than 133 bodies, although they didn't know exactly how many, so another licence had to be made to continue. There was no investigation by the Irish government into who these extra women were, why their deaths weren't declared, they were just allowed to dig them up. Eventually it came out that 155 women and children had been buried there, 22 more than they said, and they were all exhumed by the beginning of September. 154 of these women were cremated and reburied at Glasnevin Cemetery, which was nearby, and one was taken by relative to be buried at a family plot. Yes, cremated, meaning that no matter of any future investigations, these women could never be identified, nor a cause of death established. It seems that the majority of the families had no idea that any of this was going on, nor did the general public at the time, and there was a lot of anger when it all started to come out. This seems to be the beginning of true public awareness of the laundries, and the women who had suffered through their own years in the laundry started to come out and tell their stories, but it would be very slow for it to really reach its peak. Women started to come out of the woodwork telling stories of how they'd be forced to work 12 to 13 hours a day, every single day, woken up at the crack of dawn to pray, eat, work, eat, pray, sleep, repeat, and that was their life. They would be beaten for daring to speak to their working neighbour, if they weren't deemed to be pious enough, if they spoke out against their treatment. Stories started to come out of how the laundries were essentially prisons. These women would be forced to work 12 to 13 hours a day, every single day, woken up at the crack of dawn where they would pray, eat, work, eat, pray, sleep and repeat. They would be beaten by the nuns for daring to even speak to their working neighbour, if they were deemed to not be pious enough, if they spoke out against their treatment. It was a prison. The women would later say how they would be whipped with belts, locked inside at night with bars on the dormitory windows, locked away in solitary if they were deemed to have broken the rules. They would be fed just enough to keep them working, whilst nuns ate full meals just a table away. One survivor called Marina Gambold told the BBC in 2013 that she was taken to the laundries when she was 16. She was orphaned as a child and sent to live with her grandmother, but eventually she had nowhere else to go, so a priest took her to the laundries. She said of her experience, I walked up the steps that day and the nun came out and said, your name is changed, you are Fidelma. I went in and I was told I had to keep my silence. I was working in the laundry from 8 in the morning until 6 in the evening. I was starving with the hunger. I was given bread and dripping for my breakfast every morning. We had to scrub corridors. I used to cry with sore knees, housemaid's knees. I used to work all day in the laundry doing the white coats and the pleating. One day I broke a cup and the nun said, I will teach you to be careful. She got a thick string and she tied it around my neck for three days and three nights and I had to eat off the floor every morning. Then I had to get down on my knees and I had to say, I beg almighty God's pardon, our lady's pardon, my companion's pardon for the bad example I have shown. And it seems that that was just the tip of the iceberg. The routine seemed to be prayer, silence, work, punishment, all day, every day. But who were these women sent to the laundries and why did the laundries exist in the first place? Well, to get our answers, we have to go back to the very beginning, of course. The very first Magdalen Asylum was actually opened in 1758 in London by some philanthropists. It was called the London Magdalen Hospital or the Magdalen Hospital for the reception of penitent prostitutes. Before somebody shouts at me for saying the word prostitute, that was just the name of the place. It was opened after a proposal by a man called Robert Dingley that said that something should be done to reclaim young women who had had a moral lapse and had turned to sex work. The goal was to take in penitent women who wanted to turn their life around. The name Magdalene came from Mary Magdalene, a biblical figure and apparent former sex worker who repented for her ways. Any woman who entered the very first Magdalene house would be put to work with laundry and needlework and given religious instruction on how to repent for their sins, and they varied in age from 15 to 40. 
Soon, the London hospital had to move to bigger premises and other Magdalen houses popped up across the UK, pretty much in all of the big cities. By the Victorian times in the UK, the Magdalen houses turned into what we would now know as workhouses, and as a result, they were slowly phased out when the Factory Act of 1901 limited working hours for teenage girls to just 12 hours a day. Only 12 hours. The first laundry opened up in Dublin less than a decade after the first in London. It was called the Magdalen Asylum for Penitent Females, and they originally only accepted Protestant women who were attempting to change their ways. Then they popped up in cities all across the USA, Canada, Sweden and Australia and other places. Whilst nowadays when you hear of the laundries you only tend to think about them in relation to Ireland and to be fair this video is mostly in relation to Ireland, they were actually found in a lot of western countries. Conditions at the laundries varied from country to country, institution to institution, mostly popping up with that goal of rehabilitating sex workers and ensuring they were given that all important spot in heaven. The asylums totally came out of care for their infinite well-being, of course, not just wanting cheap labour. No, nope, definitely not. In the years after the Great Famine in Ireland, though, any chance for cheap labour was viewed as a way to get Ireland back on its feet, and so the laundries really started to hit off. Just like in the UK, as labour laws came in, a lot of the laundries around the world naturally started to come to an end. They were essentially workhouses, working women's stupid hours, and they simply stopped being legal in a lot of places. But Ireland just kind of slipped under the radar. Catholicism steeped so deep in society that the religious orders and nuns were able to continue doing what they were doing without the government really getting too involved. In Catholic society, wayward women or just anyone who fell out of the norm were considered the worst of society, and if they could hide them away, they would. And these women were often referred to as fallen women. Of course, the Magdalene laundries were first specifically designed for sex workers to change their ways, as we've covered. But by the end of the 1800s, any woman who didn't fit in with the Irish Catholic idea of what women should be was sent to work. And then it was just any woman who didn't have anywhere else to go. Any woman who was deemed too sex positive or no longer a virgin, whether due to abuse or not, it didn't really matter, somebody who stole something, even as small as an apple, would be sent to the laundry. If you spoke back to people of authority, if you showed questioning of the Catholic faith, off you'd go. If you were simply too beautiful, or if you were mentally ill or had learning difficulties, if you were an orphan who had nowhere else to go, or part of a family who just had one too many daughters to feed, off you went. Literally any woman outside of the boundaries of what Catholicism considered the perfect woman would be a potential victim for the laundries. Even the judicial system would sentence women to the laundries as punishment for crimes. Family and friends were discouraged from visiting the laundries, but on the very rare occasion a visit would be allowed, they'd be closely supervised by the nuns. So a lot of the time these women would never see their loved ones ever again. Unwed pregnant mothers or mothers to young children would almost certainly be sent to mother and baby homes, which were a separate entity from the laundries entirely, but collaborated closely with them, and they were also run by nuns. Pregnant women in these houses would have their babies ripped away from them at birth and have the babies taken to the orphanage and the mother to the laundry and they would never see each other again. Honestly, the mother and baby homes could be a whole other video in itself as they are, as I said, separate and they have a very high death toll themselves. The remains of almost 800 infants were discovered at a former mother and baby home in just 2017 in... Tuam, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, County Galway, mostly buried in the 50s. These homes, like the laundries, were supposed to offer shelter, but instead offered only cruelty. Often the orphanages, laundries and industrial schools would always be on the same land, just metres away from each other, but mothers and babies would still be kept apart. It was another form of punishment, an unwed mother was considered unfit to raise a child. Sex was the biggest shame and purity was valued above everything else. 
I read one source which said how the nuns seemed to punish unwed mothers above all. If you were sent to the laundry fresh after birthing your child and showed any signs of post-birth, so leaking nipples, pain, bleeding, you'd be punished simply for being. The babies would be born in convent hospitals, after which the nuns would quickly take them away to the orphanages. According to the Macalise Report, which is a 2013 official report into the laundries, up to 2,000 children were illegally exported without mother's permissions from the laundries to both the UK and the USA, where they would mostly be adopted out by wealthy families. Girls on average as young as 12 could be sent to the laundries, although the youngest I read was 8 and the oldest age I read was 89. Many families would send their young daughters to the laundries under the impression that they would be provided with a great education by the nuns, but of course, that never happened. At the end of the day, laundries were businesses, and if the nuns didn't have enough workers, they would need to find new people to come in. And sometimes that included a few white lies about the conditions and what the girls and the families would actually expect. As time went on, the women sent to the laundry stopped being so much associated with sex or being wayward, and a lot of the times it was just families sending their daughters there for a good education. And at least a quarter of the women who were held in the laundries after 1922 were sent there by the state. The judicial system sentenced women to the laundries instead of to jail, and they were used by the state as de facto jails or halfway homes. It's estimated that over 2,000 women in the laundry between 1922, which is when Ireland became a free state, and 1996 were sent there by state authorities. And we're not talking huge criminals here either. The McAleese report states that some women were sent to the laundry for so crimes as minor as just forgetting to pay for a train ticket. As much as they want to deny it, the state knew that the situation in the laundries was akin to imprisonment, but they didn't care all that much. They actually definitely knew that it was bad, according to the aforementioned McAleese report. The state were the ones who gave lucrative laundry contracts to these institutions. The government and the army were the laundry's biggest clients, and the women spent long hours every day washing clothes and linen because of these contracts. Hotels were also a huge client, but the government accounted for almost 20% of the laundry sales. And because the laundries were considered workplaces, they were subject to the Factory Acts. This meant that the laundries would have been inspected by the state on a fairly regular basis, just like any other workplace in the country. The state definitely knew what was going on, they just turned a blind eye. When it came to the goings-on of the Catholic Church, they were pretty much allowed to get away with whatever they wanted, including slave labour apparently, because the huge majority of these women never saw a single penny for their thousands of hours of hard work and incredibly poor treatment. It was later reported that the state failed to protect and defend the individual liberty and human rights of the women in the Magdalene laundries, as they had a right to expect in a democratic state governed by the rule of law. By the time many girls eventually left the laundries, they had minimal education. Many were illiterate, knowing little to nothing of the outside and how the world worked, apart from how to do laundry, chores and needlework to the best of their abilities. And this was intentional as well. Keep the girls uneducated and they'll rely on the Magdalene system more and more. They'll be less likely to leave. Most girls slash women would stay in the laundries for an average of three years. But for many, it was a much longer ordeal. And you weren't just suddenly allowed to leave once you reached legal age or decided you wanted to. The only way you could really leave was at the request of a family member or if you ran away and attempted to make it on your own. Many women spent their whole lives in the laundries and ended up dying there, as illustrated by the mass grave found at High Park. Although running away might sound like the obvious thing to do in a situation like this, it wasn't always that easy. For one, the guardie would actively pursue women who escaped from the laundries and you'd be sent right back once captured. They didn't even have to have a warrant to do so. And two, you most often knew nothing of the outside world. How were you supposed to survive outside the laundry? From the day you entered the institution, you were essentially brainwashed, you were changed. 
In many cases, the nuns gave you a new name or no name if you were just assigned a number that you were expected to answer to. Your hair would be cut, any personal items would be taken away, any letters sent to you by loved ones would be intercepted and hidden away or destroyed. And you certainly, as I said, weren't paid any wages for your hard work. When and if you were released, it was often just without warning, you were just unceremoniously thrown out onto the streets with no money, no belongings and no education, left to fend for yourself. People would later say that the lack of education was the toughest thing because it would lead to a huge loss of opportunity later in life. And of course, I am generalising here. This is generally what people say of their time in the laundries. But each one is different and everyone's experience was different. Although on the much rarer side, you will occasionally find people who look back on their time in the laundries with nothing but fondness, saying their experience is nothing like the abuse others speak about but it was bad for the majority of people. The McAleese report would later state that there were several recorded incidents of physical abuse and punishment, starving, solitary confinement and even worse. But more women would mention the mental cruelty, the abusive words and humiliation. There were also rumours of sexual abuse but those claims were a bit harder to verify. Between 1922 and 1996, like I said, 1922 is when Ireland became a free state, the laundries officially recorded 879 deaths from a variety of natural causes, although unofficial numbers are thought to be closer to 1600. There's a group called Justice of Magdalens who have spent years interviewing survivors and collecting testimonials to do with deaths, burials, gravestones, exhumations, etc. And 1600 is the number that they came up with. The state, of course, denies that the number was this high. But if I had to place my bets, I'd place it closer to 1600 than 800. The Justice for Magdalene's group was actually set up by a so-called Magdalene baby, the daughter of a Magdalene woman who was stripped away from her mother at birth and sent to the US for adoption. Justice for Magdalene's has been a driving force behind finally getting justice for many Magdalene's who just eventually left the laundries and disappeared under the radar. The last laundry officially closed in 1996, although the majority of them had closed in the early 1970s. Not so much due to people figuring out about the bad treatment as you'd think, but mostly just because laundrettes became more popular and the washing machines started to pop up in the everyday household, so there just wasn't the demand for laundries that there once was. Coming back full circle around to the beginning of this video again, public awareness around what really happened in the laundries began around 1993 with the mass graves. But even then, it would take many years for the Irish government to make any acknowledgement of it. In 2001, the government did recognise that the women in the laundries were victims of abuse. However, it definitely wasn't their fault, they said. They said they had nothing to do with it. It was all to do with the Catholic Church and the laundries were privately run, so outside of their jurisdiction. For years, the state refused any calls for investigation and compensation for these victims, despite the fact that, as we've covered, there is a lot of evidence showing that Irish courts routinely sent women convicted of petty crimes to the laundries and gave the laundries lucrative contracts. They refused to do as little as even issue an official apology to the victims. In 2009, the then Minister for Education and Science, Mr. Bat O'Keefe, rejected JFM, the Justice for Magdalene's call for an apology and distinct redress scheme, claiming once again that the laundries were privately operated and that the state did not refer individuals, and the state was only apparently liable for children transferred from residential institutions. He said outright, we're not going to apologise for this. Eventually, in 2011, a full investigation was started looking into the laundries, and the findings would be released in 2013 in the McAleese Report. The government couldn't really deny the part they played in the laundries any longer, so in February 2013, a formal apology was made to Madeline survivors, saying that they were failed for many years. Although it is worth saying that many people, many survivors, claim that the report barely even brushed the surface of what really went on at the laundries. Apparently it just covered the bare minimum it needed to place some blame on the government, but probably not all the blame that was required. 
The apology that came as a result was pretty much just the bare minimum, but it was something, and it brought more awareness and validity to survivors' claims. It lifted the silence and was something to relieve the stigma and shame which Irish society had placed on them in an effort to rationalise how this abuse was just accepted for years. Because whilst we can blame the Catholic Church and the government, outside people did also know what was going on. Regular people who just turned a blind eye. Sure, there's not much the regular person could have done to make a difference here, but it was accepted. And then when the survivors started to come out about their stories, they were silenced because the public couldn't accept that it had been allowed to happen. It really ran deep. As of 2013, the president of the Irish Law Reform Commission spoke with 337 survivors about their needs and with the church, who still had 117 women living in their care. Of course, when the laundry shut down for good in 1996, there were still some women who didn't want to go out to regular life, they didn't know how, so they remained under the care of the nuns. Some of these women had ongoing needs, struggling with trauma at the time, and dealing with lifelong physical ailments as a result. Women who had been in the laundries had arthritis in their hands, back pain from hours a day spent bent over, burns, and more. In June 2013, the Minister for Justice announced recommendations for monetary compensation to be made to survivors. Lump sum payments from €11,500 to €50,000, with additional small weekly instalments for women detained for longer than three and a half years. There were medical cards to be provided, a dedicated unit to provide assistance to the women in meeting each other and the nuns, advice regarding educational and housing benefits, a helpline accessible daily, and a process to establish a memorial. This was also relevant to survivors who no longer lived in Ireland, because after release, a lot of women just fled the country, heading mostly to the UK and the USA. This made it very hard to track all the survivors down and get their stories, and may have also been a reason why Ireland was able to hide what went on for so long. All of this was something, but it didn't make up for the trauma these women suffered. But at least now they were recognised and had some semblance of help. We focus a lot on the blame of the government here, but what about the Catholic Church? Well, the Church is still adamant that it did nothing wrong, and point blank refused to contribute towards any compensation funds. Many of the religious institutes responsible, so the Sisters of Mercy, the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity of the Good Shepherd, and Sisters of Charity, have refused demands from not only the government, but also from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and the UN Committee Against Torture. In the immediate aftermath of the 2013 apology, two sisters anonymously gave an interview to RTE Radio 1, in which they described the media's coverage as a one-sided, anti-Catholic forum, and denied that any apology was needed. They said they provided a free service for the country. Honestly, from my research, it seems that, once again, the church has pretty much been allowed to get away with the rather large part they played in the Magdalene Laundries, and rather large is under-exaggerating. And also the abuse of tens of thousands of women and children, and they've said that any criticism of the Laundries is a lie. Honestly, this does make me nervous and I'm rather hesitant to openly criticise the Catholic Church for their part in this because the last time I criticised Catholicism, I got a whole barrage of hate. But like, seriously, this really was just swept under the carpet and forgotten about and they've gotten away here without so much as an apology. As of 2014, there were still 600 living survivors that we know of, of the laundries, but I think we're safe to assume that number might be significantly lower now in 2021, seven years later. Out of at least 10,000 women who were forced into the laundries in just the last century, that's a very small percentage to ever see something like justice. The Magdalene laundries are something which I've heard the name of so many times, but I never really knew what it meant, so I was shocked in my research for this. The tales of some of the victims are heartbreaking, they went through things that no one should ever have to go to. And then there's the children who are torn away from their mothers for no reason. The ripple effect of this goes far beyond just the women involved, it affected so many people's lives. Thank you so much for tuning in this week and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.